Split off from VVAW uh, at the national office and joined AI, uh, who actually ultimately kicked me out of the chapter. When, when uh, Gary Lawton vis visited, they asked me to be his driver. And it was incredible. He was like a saint. <laughs> I just will never get over how much respect I have for that man and his commitment to humanity. We can move unless someone else wants to say something. Uh, one of the most important things that was overlooked about Dr. Ron Sable was his contribution to Vietnam veterans in the Agent Orange battle here in Chicago. He helped form, along with Quentin Young and physicians for what later became Physicians for Social Responsibility, an occupational health clinic at Cook County Hospital that was the first place to interview all of us who were members and the original signatures uh, and their children of the Agent Orange struggle. And Ron, Ron, Dr. Ron was uh, the key person in that. He was the motivating factor of getting these other politically mm -hmm. conscious doctors gone. And his, his work has meant uh, hundreds of lives. And uh, Dr. Ron Sable should be remembered for that as much as all the other political things that he did. Vietnam bets against the war. When Clarence was dying of AIDS, I would get a call from intensive care and he would say, Barry, boy, we got this anti-apartheid movement going. Have you ever read, have you read the ANC's charter? What a thing to live for. Could we ever write a charter like they wrote? And I would say, I don't know, Brother Clarence. <laughs> and he would say, I got to guarantee you, I'm going to get out and I'm going to keep struggling. Doctors say I ain't going to make it. I'm not only going to make it, I'm going to change the world. Clarence went to Nicaragua. He let nothing stand in his way. Other people shying away. Clarence calling from intensive care. Salute. And I know a lot of people got so, so. Uh, Among the people in 1986 that went on a trip to um, Nicaragua was also Mike Patios. And Mike was probably one of the more, uh, uh, he fancied himself quite the ladies man. I could never see it. Uh, but uh, he had a, such a droll sense of humor and presentation, and it, it was always a pleasure to be with. And uh, I spent uh, the evening after the, the labor march in New York last spring uh, with Mike uh, down in Little Italy, sitting out drinking coffee and smoking illegal Cuban cigars um, that they sold at this place. And m we talked quite a bit about the trip to Nicaragua and what an incredible collection of people a few of whom are here today, we had in the talent and the knowledge and, and the way that we cut a swarth across that country and, and earned the admiration of the Nicaraguan people and the Sandinistas and some of the things that people did uh, at the embassy, Billy's organizing things at the embassy. But Mike was up there as a f official photographer and he was quite good at that. And uh, he asked me, the last time I saw him, that if why more people didn't talk to him if people didn't like him, and I said, no, uh, Mike, they're just keeping their women away from him. You know? <laughs> Clarence was with us on that trip, and uh, <clears throat> our head of security, one William Branson, who 
chooses to remain invisible at all times, <clears throat> even though he's here. Um, was always in a dither because we couldn't get everyone on the bus, and he'd be standing there with his clipboard, the name, show me your passport, get on the bus, show me your passport, where's your stuff, get your stuff, get your passport, okay, show me your passport, get on the bus. Where's Clarence? Clarence would invariably have dragged one of the interpreters with him and would be talking to a crowd of revolutionary Sandinista women or a bunch of people that came out of a church or a bunch of kids over besides the side of the road. Clarence would, was like an instant podium. I mean, everywhere he went, a crowd would gather around him and so the bus would always be late waiting for Clarence and, and one of the two interpreters to, or, and he even hooked the, the official Sandinista interpreter and made him his, his spokesman on several occasions. It's just an absolutely wonderful, uh, effusive man and uh, uh, he so loved the organization and, and the organization um, has returned it in many ways. Man, we miss him dearly. I think we're going to start now in the dedication, in the remembrance. Yes, without photos. Yes. Yes, absolutely. The only people we have photos on this list is Mike Carmody and John Niffen. Right. That's Niffen. Niffen, right. But. Let's put them up there. I told people that we had, you know, people. Well, one, one, and, and. If that's how you want to do it, be great. Okay, 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 okay. okay. We have a number of people uh, where we have names. The first person, of course, is our comrade from Texas. Gainesville 8, John Niffen. Salute. Those birds don't look like him. Hi, everybody. I came back from Vietnam in 1970 and went to Fort Sam Houston. My name's Tom Wetzler. When I got to Fort Sam, I found that there were some young GIs there who had started an anti-war paper, Your Military Left, on their own, and I joined their staff. I was still the only Vietnam veteran working with the staff and often felt kind of isolated. I'd spoken to some of my other brothers who were still active duty, and. They were just getting into other things. They really didn't want to be bothered at that time. We, had, we didn't have much money, and there was one news service we subscribed to, which was Zodiac News, an alternative news service. And we got over the wire one day a, a story of Operation Raw, where veterans had marched from Valley Forge, New Jersey to, I'm sorry, from Morristown, New Jersey to Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, doing guerrilla theater along, along the way. You've heard about it earlier. I immediately called, found the, uh, the national phone number in New York and called, and they put me in touch with the Texas office, which I then called, who was, and that, at that time, the coordinator for Texas was Terry DeBow. With Terry was a man named John Niffen. Uh, 
A few weeks later, I went up to have a meeting uh, with people from around the state in Texas for Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and I met Terry and John both. Uh, later on, I got out of the Army and was fully full-time involved with VVAW work, and we had a, a week-long operation there that went along with other national operations over uh, 71, 72, Christmas 71 time, where we were at Colleen at Fort Hood, and I got to know John a lot better. Over the, John had been a Marine. He spent six years in the Marine Corps. He did three tours in Vietnam, left during the uh, Tet-68 offensive, shot up fairly fairly badly. As a matter of fact, he had so much shrapnel in his body, he used to set off the, uh, the different alarms when he would go through. Uh, during, the, during the trial that happened later, he would always stand there and smile as the U.S. Marshals would run their wands over him and not tell him why he was setting them off. But he, he was the kind of guy that was real quiet and uh, very clear on things and real stringent with the idea of veterans taking their own initiative and speaking for themselves and not, not being allowed to be co-opted by everybody else who wanted to use us. I know many areas in the country that were trying to figure out our identity and how we were supposed to re work with each other. Uh, John was kind of independent at the point of being downright cranky from time to time. As a matter of fact, if you didn't yell at each other with him, uh, it's not, you didn't have a friendship. Uh, his relationship sometimes when Terry left and he took over as the state coordinator with the national office was kind of iffy. You know, John didn't understand why we were supposed to do things like paperwork. You know, that was just, you know, uh, there was a request for the, for the VVAW uh, membership papers to be sent in and John worked for a while and he had the office. His office was a back porch that was screened in and he piled up all the membership papers to be sent and and at the same time, he had a cat, and the cat was pissed off at him, so the cat got on the pile of papers and pissed on the papers, which John looked at and said, okay, I guess they're ready to send now. <laughs> Years later, I went up to the national office for a meeting and said, yeah, we could always find Texas by the smell. <laughs> but John was a good friend to me and a lot of other vets, and he was the kind of guy, he and his wife Kathy would open their house to anyone who needed something and uh, would give you the shirt off his back if he decided you were a friend. Uh, a lot of old time members will, you know, will remember him for his, he had a real clarity of thinking uh, about some things, and then he'd get, can be real stubborn and ob obstinate. He also was a rare person who could say, I guess I was wrong, I'm sorry or I forgot, anything's possible, and he moved on from there. He passed away a couple of years ago. We had a large funeral there in Texas with a lot of the old uh, VVW people. I know some of them have re-upped. Terry DeBow is now in Arkansas, and, and I see him on the, uh, on the, on the uh, email list and things like that from time to time. But he's one of those guys that, for me personally, I'll always remember in my life during some real dark times in the early years of figuring out my own PTSD issues. Uh, uh, he was re is a real, uh, real rock in a gentle kind of way. For someone who could be so cantankerous, he also had the ability to be very gentle at the same time and to speak clearly. Anyway, those are just some of my own memories about John and I wanted to share them with you because I know that there's some of you here who remember him and let's see who else we've got. I, I got to say something about John Niffen. I love John Niffen. God, he was incredible. When I was uh, Mississippi State Coordinator for Vietnam Veterans Against the War, only two people from outside of the state came to visit me. And one of them was John Niffen. And he was incredible. He made me feel like there's a veterans movement going on, despite the fact that the other 32 members in my state uh, wanted to be underground. It is back, they stayed that way because uh, when I uh, got my FBI report years later, it said David Curry and his wife Jeanette Curry are the only known members of Vietnam Veterans Against the War to ever operate in Mississippi. So we did okay. But John came there and he taught me so much. He talked with me about where we needed to go. He talked to me about revolution. And I, I saw him. In, in, in Miami, of course, after he was one of the part of the Gainesville Eight. And the last time I saw him, uh, 
it was Dewey Canyon 4 or whatever they call that march when we wanted to kick Nixon out of office. And uh, actually, Bill Shunas pulled me off a car I wanted to attack. <laughs> I don't know why, but, but finally I got beat up by the police, which, uh, as Barry says, as usual. But as I was laying there on the ground, Bart Savage came up crying and said, Oh, Dave, what have I done to you? And John Niffen came up and said, you know, we don't have any medals in this business, in this, this organization. <laughs> he said, I'll buy you a milk shop someday, a milkshake someday, though. So I loved them. Before we have any more dedications, we're going to have Suzanne Webster play a song for us on bagpipes. And if you are interested in making a dedication to a fallen comrade, please make your way up to the front and I will get you up here in line to speak and ask you to keep it to about two to three minutes. And uh, with that, we'll have Suzanne play. But in the meantime, could I have um, Tim Butts make his way up to the front, and Jay Helena, and Jan Berry. Um, my name is Tim Butts, and. Uh, <coughs> talk about two of my friends, um, and I'll tell a story that I think will weave the two stories together. Um, my first involvement with BBAW was uh, organizing a chapter at Kent State University right after the uh, murder of four students and the wounding of 13 others. And 
in October of that year, the National Office asked me to work on the Winter Soldier investigation, and I had to leave Kent. And David Childs took over keeping the chapter alive, and when he got too ill, there was another successor, and finally it passed on to a man named Mike Carmody. And I couldn't agree with Mike's politics, to say the least, but Mike was the kind of guy that would argue with you and then laugh with you and drink a beer with you and not take it personally. He had a great sense of humor. Um, like I said, it's, I, I thought his politics were a little weird, but you know, we all have a little weirdness in us. And uh, Mike passed away after he uh, served in as the uh, chapter leader there at Kent State. Uh, he went off and did some other things. Uh, his dad was a rubber worker, a member of the United Rubber Workers in Akron, and uh, Mike went to work at Cyberling Rubber and uh, did organizing for the, the URW there, or actually a dissident faction thereof, published a, a dissident newsletter. Uh, Mike always had others in his heart. He really saw a vision of a better world. And uh, while well, I, uh, again, I, I, you, how can you fault a guy that at least sits down and thinks about things and has a vision and acts on it? That's, we should all do that. We should all have that kind of value where uh, we think outside of ourselves, we think outside of our personal comfort, and uh, we act on it. Um, after I did the Winter Soldier investigation work in Detroit, uh, they sent me to Washington to do advance work for Dewey Canyon 3. And uh, I met a man there named Rod Kane. And uh, Rod came to Washington, D.C. He, he'd been in the 101st Airborne and uh, was a medic. At, at age 19, he was a medic. And he was always haunted by the fact that at age 19, he was asked to make life or death decisions about people, who got treated in the field and who he left to die. And he was never able to resolve that. Uh, it haunted him all of his life. And, uh, but he was going to go to Ireland. And he came to Washington, D.C. in the spring of 1971 to get a visa to go to Ireland. And lo and behold, here's a couple thousand Vietnam vets camped on the mall. And he says, hell, I'm home. I, I found a brotherhood. I'm not going to Ireland. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay and, and work with this, this great group. And he did for years and years. He, he was part of VVAW in Washington, D.C. And uh, he and I were roommates two different periods. One was when VVAW had a house in northwest Washington. We called it the Veterans Embassy, and uh, he lived there uh, and was part of the group that uh, worked on all the stuff after uh, Dewey Canyon 3. And then later, uh, he and I shared an apartment in the mid-70s. And uh, during that time, Rod would sit with a pen, a, a flare pen, and a yellow legal pad, and he would spend his days when he wasn't working uh, tuck pointing houses or doing things that are similar, he would write and he would write and he would write. Uh, I left DC in 78 and uh, Rod stayed there and in the mid 1980s he self-published a couple of books that were based on all these yellow legal pads and uh, they were being sold at a place called Kramer Books which is just north of DuPont Circle in Washington DC and someone from Simon & Schuster bought one of his books and was blown away by it. Uh, and they approached him. He actually had three different like chapbooks that he'd self-published. And Simon & Schuster decided to take a chance on Rod. And the result of it was this book, which is called Veterans Day, A Combat Odyssey. And uh, let me read this to you real quick. This is the review from the New York Times. Veterans Day joins such classics as Michael Hur's Dispatches, Daniel Lang's Casualties of War, and Ron Kovic's Born on the Fourth of July as an, as an indictment of how, 
how the war scarred so many lives. Um, this book is still used in literature classes at uh, those few universities that still offer courses about literature in Vietnam. Uh, unfortunately, Rod had a uh, congenital lung disease, a hereditary lung disease, and uh, he died in 1999 at, at the age of 53. Uh, Mike died in 1987. And as I look at these two different guys that I considered friends, I, I tried to think about what would they say about today? What, what could they agree upon? Because they couldn't agree on politics. Um, and I'd like to read a little poem that I think reflects their, their consensus. <clears throat> I turn on my television as the reporter says, today in Fallujah, a roadside bomb killed eight more. And I look at the screen and see another charred Humvee, another dead Iraqi kid, another mother crying over a child's body. I cannot watch this and I walk away. I turn on my radio as the Beatles sing, I read the news today, oh boy. And I look at the paper and see another new name, another young face, another father holding a folded American flag. I cannot read this and I walk away. I dream of happier times, but my brain interrupts. Have we learned nothing from the dead of Vietnam? And I close my eyes and I see another P.D. Burgess, another Pat Mortis, another generation foolishly sacrificed. I cannot walk away. I think they would agree on that. And uh, here's to them. Salute. Salute. If I can intrude. Mike Carmody moved to Chicago, and he spent his last years here. And uh, VVAW played an important role in Harold Washington's campaign of providing white people that would work for a black mayoral candidate in the most southern city, north of the Mason-Dixon line. And Mike believed in working with his people. Mike moved to Bridgeport because he was Irish. Mike said, I'll go door to door for Harold Washington in Bridgeport with Daly and the machine. Mike went door to door and wore a giant shirt that said, I heart uh, Washington. And uh, at the end of the day, as he always would, He'd go to a bar to drink, and he was sitting there drinking a beer. And he said, I was there drinking a beer, thinking about God knows what. And all of a sudden, someone hit me from behind, and they knocked me blind. And he was there sitting with a broken bottle on the back of his head. And he said, I couldn't see. No one was coming to his aid. And so Mike said, fuck it. And he twirled on the bar seat toward where he thought his attacker was. And he said, if that's the best you got, motherfucker, you're in trouble. And he rolled back around and he waited for number two. Well, number two never came because Mike had more guts than that fucking whole bar. Salute. Ellie, would you come up? Hi, my name is Ellie Shunas. And for those of you who read The Veteran, I am Mrs. Fraggings. Um, I would like to, us to remember uh, two people whom I know the local people remember. One is David Henry Stroop, an Army veteran who died of Agent Orange-related cancer. The other one is Bruce Barnett, who is also a veteran who was with the local chapter. Both of these guys were 
good friends of all of ours. And I think the thing that they mostly had in common, oh, there's Bruce. <laughs> the thing I think they had in common was that they were both had this irreverent and sarcastic humor. They were able to punch holes in the people who were inflated and bring them down to size. And I just loved that about them. They loved life and they loved people and they especially were dedicated in their own ways to stopping the madness that had enveloped them as they were veterans. So this is for Dave and for Bruce. Is Jan Barry in here? You're up. I wanted to speak very briefly regarding Sheldon Ramsdale. His photographs are in the booklet. Um, I wrote a poem which I forgot to bring with me. That's okay. I'm going to give you the short version. He gave up a very good career as a professional photographer to be an activist with BBAW, but he brought the camera, he brought his crazy, wacky sense of humor, and he brought the secret of being gay in the 60s. He died, I think, in 1996 of AIDS in San Francisco, still an activist. And that's what it said in his obituary in the San Francisco newspapers, and I'm thinking thinking that he would have been very proud to have seen in the headlines that he was an activist on these various social issues over his lifetime. The second person is Kevin Kelly, who, when I met him in 1969, came out of the moratoriums, those huge demonstrations, and he had heard there used to be a veterans organization, or a rumor of one, because VVAW had fallen upon hard times. Nobody really wanted to do anything for a long period of time after people came to Chicago to the convention here and saw what had happened, even if they didn't get hit, that this is, this is not what they wanted to do with their lives. And he says, let's go back and do it all over again and put a whole new, he was a ball of energy, and then like many people who were involved in VVAW, he went and did other things, and I didn't know what he was doing for a very long period of time. And then when John Kerry is running for president, a newspaper re reporter calls me from Memphis, Tennessee, and says, do you know a man named Kevin Kelly? He says he was a co-founder of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. I said, well, that's kind of true. I mean, from his perspective, he didn't know what we did a year before. There was an organization that it sort of fell apart for a while. He says, well, he's a very prominent business person in Memphis, Tennessee, and we're doing a profile of him. And just, you know, let me tell you, he has this very serious disease. Uh, it's something like Lou Gehrig's disease. But I was able to email with him. I'm not sure if we had a telephone conversation or not, but we had some email conversations, and he died last year. And the proudest thing, again, in that profile and in his obituary was he was a founder, a co-founder of Vietnam Veterans Against the War and a Republican. Thank you. Salute. Carl has something to add about Shelley. There are just some folks that enjoy this kind of scene, right? Of, getting together and telling stories and reminiscing and just, just get energized by it. And Shelley was one of those people. He would have loved to have been here. He would have just loved to have been here and proudly let all of you know that he was among that uh, first group in New York and that, that he took these pictures, okay? And I don't know how many of you have uh, children who have been through our educational system in the last couple of decades, but I have a 23-year-old. 
it's been really hard for me to get him to, to focus on you know, what we did and why and, and to even look at some of these pictures. But, but one day he happened to see this one. He said, Dad, is that you with Martin Luther King? Well, that he understood. And all of his friends have understood that. And whenever they come over, you know, he says, that's, that's my, my dad with Martin Luther King. Well, it was, it was wonderful for me to have Shelley there taking those pictures and, and to have that history. And uh, we miss him a lot. So, salute. Hi, my name's Bill Davis. And uh, Barry took one of the greatest ever Michael Carmody stories. But uh, Michael and I had a, Michael and I were much more than guys who were in VVAW together. When we ended up back up in VVAW together, it renewed a lifelong uh, acquaintance. Uh, my mother ran a bar on the North Hill of Akron, and this snotty nosed little Irish kid used to come in there and shine shoes. And I wonder who the hell this kid thought he was infringing on my territory. And I always wanted to kick his ass. And all those years back, I knew him. And then I met him again uh, after the Kent State chapter was founded. And another person, uh, Al Morris, was a founding member also. Um, a lot of the guys who were VVAW members at, at, uh, at Kent uh, also worked out at the Ravenswood uh, arsenal <laughs> uh, after they got out. And um, before the chapter officially formed, uh, the year after the ROTC building was burnt down at Kent State with the predictable uh, results that you know, a group of Vietnam veterans agreed on the anniversary to build a replica of the ROTC building um, based on the pictures and the drawings as a memorial to what had happened the previous year. And the, the press was all there, and military dignitaries, and the governor, and all these high mucky mucks, and all the school administrators. And as soon as the program was over, they torched it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the next day, they identified themselves as the Kent State chapter of Vietnam veterans against the war. <laughs> and those, those two guys and those other brothers did some pretty amazing things. Uh, did anyone talk about Dr. Sable? Oh, okay, I'll get, no, I'll get out of the way. No. Well, I have to put in my thing about the amazing Shelley Ramsdell, who was just more fun than anybody. A um, couple of Shelley stories. One was back when the George Bush Five, the original folks that threw blood at George Bush, were trying to meet with George Bush around the UN. Shelley was hanging out with us, and Danny Friedman was jumping over hedges on people, and Shelley's taking pictures, and he was just so serene and so sweet, and he had us so giggling. And then a bunch of years later, when somebody said something against me in a Florida meeting, and he stood up and said, do you have a fucking idea what you're talking about? And Shelley never cursed much, so everybody looked and went, shit, maybe we shouldn't fuck with her. <laughs> and then just seeing him last, the last time I saw Shelley was at the 25th in New York, and I was so glad he was able to get there. The other person I'd like to remember is a guy who let me go with 60,000 vets to dedicate the wall and who gave up his entire refrigerator to fill it full of beer for this guy and that guy and a couple of other guys. And his name was Ralph Shrimp, my late husband. Thanks, guys. I'm back. I started remembering dead guys. <laughs> it's like the kid who said, I hear the dead. And they were yelling at me. OK, you've got pictures of both of them in the slideshow. I'll start with Ron Sable. Ron Sable was an incredible human being. He was an MD who had been a combat medic in Vietnam. He joined VVAW early. Uh, I've heard many people describe him over the years as being in VVAW. 
and as, that is being his start. I only knew him as a major gay activist in Chicago, where he ran for alderman as an openly gay candidate. First openly gay candidate. Do we have a second? Yep. We have good. We have gay aldermen. They have gay aldermen now in Chicago. God, Jan, we might ought to move back here. But anyway, Ron Sable was an incredible individual. He was bright, he was caring, he was sensitive, and for a long time he thought I was gay until I got married. And I always think that's good. It's good to be mistaken for somebody who has a, has a different gender preference than you. And it's always good as when I asked for the, I, asked, I was gonna ask some police near Barry's where his apartment was. And uh, I, I moved up and said, officers, can you give me an address? Can you help me locate an address? And they said, the mission is right over there. You can see it. And they apologized to me then when they discovered I had a real address. So I love Ron Sable very much. The, he worked hard as hell for Harold Washington. He was like, I can remember one of my favorite days with him. We spent like hours hammering signs together for the Gay, gay Liberation Parade that brought important politics into the parade. And he always brought impar important politics into the, in, into the world. And he was around in VVW back when uh, Randy Barnes, who the next person I want to talk about is, and who's also on the list. I only met Randy Barnes uh, late. I met him during the Vets for Carry campaign. Yeah, I was in Vets for Carry. I know. J John Niffin in his last will and testament. It's too loud? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have a loud voice. And I like to yell and I like to make loud noises. But, thanks, Barry. Keep me moving. Keep. About what? The loud voice? I am seeing a psychiatrist and a psychologist, but none of Okay, yeah. Don't 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 drift. Okay. My medication's in me, I should be able to pull through this. Okay. Let's go on to Randy Barnes. Randy Barnes I met in the Vets for Carry campaign, and I had read all of his role in VVAW. He had been incredibly involved in VVAW many times, and you can pick up an issue of the paper and read my salute to Randy Barnes on the very last page of the paper. But I liked him, and one of the things I liked about him, that the Missouri vets had given me a nickname because I always seemed to know the answer to all their questions. They, they had nicknamed me Radar. And he, said, he just immediately called me Radar. And I liked that. Because I thought, the more names you have, the easier it is to go underground when you have to. I know last night we did have a brother uh, from Iraq Vets, if he's still here and wants to make a recollection. And if not, and he comes back, uh, Randy's there. The other thing is Dr. Ron Sable. Dr. Ron Sable, Manhattan, Kansas. You know, medic. Then he had to go to medical school. And where does he end up but in Chicago for the blessed thing that him and Carmen D was? And that's right. And if you've read one of uh, Stud Turkle's books, which I won't go over, but there's like an incredible thing about Randy and a role he played in the lives of uh, some lesbian women who wanted children. But uh, I want to remember him 
for uh, when times were getting bad in the 80s, and we thought under Reagan that maybe they were going to take away a woman's right for choose to choose. And uh, and Ron got up, and he said, uh, "We're forming networks of doctors as a gay doctor, and if they make it illegal, we will continue to allow a woman to control her body, no matter what we have to do." He came up and put everything on the line to defend a woman's right to choose. What a sweetheart. Salute. How are you folks doing tonight? Bob McLean. First of all, I'm amazed that so many of us are still alive, you know, in 2007. So let's acknowledge yourself for still being warm. Uh, Scott Camille called me this afternoon. There are three people that he wanted to, to be remembered, and I'm just going to tell you their names. Uh, William Peterson, John Nifkin, and Jack McCluskey. I... I knew Jack McCluskey in the VVAW chapter in San Francisco is where I got to know Jack. Jack was a corpsman. He was at Way during the Tet Offensive. Jack uh, had some major PTSD that he carried, and he was a great counselor to, to all, all, all vets he encountered. Uh, Jack was my friend, and I was proud that I knew him. So thank you. More Jack. Come on, God damn it! I'll keep talking. Get up here and talk about Jack. <laughs> it's open mic night, folks. Jack McCloskey. If you didn't take your salt pills on last patrol, you're in deep shit. Okay? This man was at every van window, every car window, every campsite everything, caring for the health of his veterans moving into Miami, and at the same time riding along in another vehicle, and we got him in the last patrol film, talking about his incredible withdrawal from drugs and, 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 and the sacrifice that he had to make going up in that hotel room and locking himself in there to kick the habits. And he, and he took all of that energy and he poured it back into VVAW, and I knew him through post-Vietnam syndrome, as we called it back in the day. And he was a, he worked in San Francisco and had what they were at a, a place on Howard Street called Project 10 was where they were working out of. And ultimately, he became swords to plowshares and formed that organization. Jack McCloskey was a consummate organizer, but he didn't do it in any kind of a strategic way. He just did it through force of personality and being there and mother hinting everybody and at the same time you didn't want to fuck with him because he would tear into your ass. And he tore into the ass of the government big time. And he was a major figure and in my years in California he was always a major figure in this organization and one to be remembered forever and I was just proud to have known him and got to hang out with him a little bit because he partied hardy too and you know he was just an all around good person but there was never a more committed soul, and there was never a brother who would stand at your back better than Jack McCloskey. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then there was the Jack McCloskey I knew and loved. Jack didn't have issues, as somebody's heard me say earlier tonight, Jack had subscriptions, a multitude of subscriptions. He had a subscription to the PTSD issues. He had a subscription to the substance abuse issues. He had subscriptions, but he was the neatest guy 
It is raining outside because the motherfucker's trying to give us a fucking thunderstorm because every time he came east to San Francisco, he made one. So if it thunders and lightnings tonight, thank Jack. So Annie Luganville was Jack's mother, Han. And Annie called me up one time and she said, Annie, I live like on the second floor and Jack's in a wheelchair. Can you put him up for a couple of months? I said, sure. So I call my husband and I said, sweetheart, my friend Wacky Jack's moving in for a couple of months. Are we good with that? He said, sure. So Jack came to live with me for a couple of months. And it was at a time in his life when he hadn't been detoxing. So pretty much everything liquid, including the vanilla, disappeared the first week. <laughs> and anything in tablet form disappeared the second week. And then he proceeded to charm the socks off my mother. And, and he was running around the house with my, my then five-year-old son on his lap. And by the time he left, we had had major adventures. And you know, while Jack was not the easiest guest in the world, it was like this great gift to have had him in the house for five. But as I said, he wasn't a saint. He was just the most fun party you could have semi-legally. <laughs> Annie touched on uh, uh, Jack's relationship with Annie Luganville. And whenever Jack would come to town, he would stay with Annie and Joel Greenberg, both longtime members of Chicago chapter and active members in BBAW. Um, um, Jack uh, became a fixture uh, in the neighborhood, Annie and Joel's neighborhood. There's a bar, I think it's still there, called Amazing Grace. It's about two blocks uh, uh, west of uh, Ashland Avenue on Grace, not too far and very close walking distance to Annie and Joel's. And every year, uh, uh, on Jack's birthday, there's a, a double shot of tequila set out on the bar. And if you open, he'll come back in and drink it. Yeah, my name's Ron Farisi. I'm from Philadelphia. And I mean, for anybody who wants to know, Jack grew up in Philadelphia. He comes from Philly, grew up in an orphanage, which was called the Hut. There's a fellow over here, which was a roommate of Jack's, who knew, who grew up, not a roommate, but he grew up in the, in the same orphanage. Jack used to come to Philly pretty regularly to visit his sister and his family. And when he did, he used to bring along old chums of his from the West Coast. And he was always a character and always full of adventure whenever he showed up. The six pack of beer stayed on the side, and he was always ready to go, but that was Jack McCluskey. And he came. He was either traveling with Richie Havens or Joe McC uh, McDonald, or he was, he was ready to go all the time, all the time. But that was his Philadelphia connection. He was really proud of what he did, too, with uh, Rock Med. He started an organization to go to rock concerts and save young kids from getting in trouble, because they would get busted and be taken out to the hospital, and Jack covered them, and he was proud of that. And he, they did a story on him on CNN about Rock Med and about his, uh, his involvement with uh, helping people besides the veterans organizations. Other people from Philadelphia that we need to represent and need to toast to is one young man called Don Spurnell. I don't know if anybody here other than Philly guys can remember Don. But anybody who remembers the Winter Soldier, Don was there. Don was also the guy who threw his cane away at Dewey Canyon. Besides his medals, he threw his cane away, and he made it sail across that fence. He speared that statue. That trash pile was speared by Don's uh, cane. He was proud of what he did, and he passed away a few years back. Um, here's and Don was in Vietnam, to Yeah, Don volunteered for Vietnam so his brother wouldn't, be, wouldn't have to go. And when he came back, his brother was being sent right over. And that was Lenny Spurnell, were two brothers who, who joined us and were part of the Kansas City Adventures. And unfortunately, they're not here with us today. There's a few other brothers that were with us in Philadelphia from the Philly chapter. 
One was John Birch. He was our president and one of our leaders. He was a real quiet guy. He used to wear a vest in country, in a country style. But he was quite organized and he was the only one who kept the pencil together, you know. He could keep his pencil sharp and keep everybody together because in the meantime, we had other members. Uh, one was uh, Captain Juice who kept everybody else intoxicated. So we need somebody like John Birch to uh, figure out we got to be there at 2 o'clock. Okay, he'll make sure we get there. But um, there might be a few others that I'm not remembering. But Nathan Hale. We, you know, coming from Philadelphia, we had these unique names. Sam Adams, Nathan Hale, and John Birch. Well, Sam Adams is still active today and still on top of it all. And uh, extremely active. As a matter of fact, I just read an editorial where Sam Adams got it put in the Philadelphia City Council to fly their flags at half staff for the remainder of the Iraq engagement. As a tribute to the men who died, men and women who were involved in the war in Iraq. That's the way it should be. The way we feel that anybody who voted for Bush should pay twice as much taxes as everybody else, A. B, everybody who serves in Iraq should get free gas. Anybody who loses their life in Iraq should get free gas, their families should get free fuel for the rest of their lives. Power to the people. Uh, well, Jack doesn't get off quite that easy. Um, um, well, I, I sort of knew Jack more during his sort of declining years, you know, um, before he died. Uh, I'm proud to be associated with Source to Plowshares that Jack started. Um, and, you know, but towards the end, there was no way in hell he could have anything to do with it because it would just bring, he'd bring the whole place down. But Source just passed its 33rd year this year. They're a wonderful organization. Six million dollar budget providing services to veterans. Just got 1.8 million dollar uh, grant to provide services to Iraq veterans. Uh, so there's some good shit that Jack started with that. But um, and, and Soros is doing great. I'm happy to report. But I, <clears throat> Jack would do stuff to me and uh, and to a lot of people. And just uh, just about a year ago, we celebrated the 10th anniversary of his demise. And everybody got up and told the same stories. That they'd get these calls from Jack, and Jack say, you know, they're organizing this march on, on, in April or something. He says, and, and they're having a meeting, an organizing meeting tonight at 7 o'clock at such and such an address, and, and, and I'll meet you there. Right? And a guy, oh, yeah. And I, I do this every time. I say, okay, Jack, I'll meet you there, man. No, this son of a bitch would never show up. You know? <laughs> He never showed up to these things, but be, he'd get me interested. He'd get, oh, yeah, and then I'd wind up working on that march, and, you know. And he said, this is something you need to do, Paul, and I'll help you with it, you know. he never show up. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, go to the... Gary Lawton was framed for killing two white cops in Riverside, California. A black nationalist, he organized the community to be both independent and to have resources when problems happened and occurred. Two cops died the original night because it's our hometown. The original night, the police reported that three hippies with guns had shot two cops. Within 24 hours, it changed. Three black men <laughs> in fatigues with afros, clean shaven, 19 to 24, had killed the two white cops. Sound pantheristic. Gary couldn't have a fro <laughs> any more than I could. Gary 
was about as clean-shaven as me. <laughs> but it didn't matter because they wanted someone. And they arrested him, and Gary spent two years in solitary confinement. And the only group that rallied to his defense was Vietnam vets against the war. Gary would have died in prison if it wasn't for what all of us did. He went on trial for three times. First two were hung juries. It was only the second trial in the history of California where a person who had two hung juries went to a third trial. We had 65-year-old women who had been on the jury, white women, whose parents were captains in the police department. And they joined the defense committee. All us radical, all power to the people, and 65-year-old black women from police families. Because Gary not only was innocent, he had a way to explain the world. And so after I left the national office for the first time, because I promised Chakia and Gary that I would move back and stay there till he was freed, and, and Rusty Bernard from Texas, who was in the national office, went with me. We went back and, and had to rebuild because people had got burned out, because we watched our brothers and sisters go to prison. One brother for eight years supposedly attempted assault of mur of, uh, with a um, hubcap on a cop eight years in San Quentin. <coughs> Pardon me. And so we were doing security because a lot of people didn't like Gary. Surprise. This is the 70s. And so Rusty and I are sitting there waiting, doing security. And we look across the room in the courthouse, waiting for the trial to start. And this big fucking ass motorcycle, white dude with a see-through t-shirt and a fucking swastika that size underneath. Fuck! Rusty and I jump into action. Da, da, da. We rush forward to stop this racist from getting hold of Gary. And before we could down him, Gary had pushed us aside. He was a big man. Rusty and I weren't that big. We would have taken down the Nazi, but he pushed us aside. And in the middle of the Riverside courtroom, a Nazi biker was hugging Gary Lawton and they were talking about their trials and what was going on. When Gary was in solitaire, the biker was in the cell next to him and he had no one else to talk to. And Gary might have been a radical, but he believed you could change people even fucking Nazi bikers. And he talked to him, and he said, why do you hate Jews? I just don't understand it. I never met a Jew, said Gary. <laughs> why do you hate people you don't even meet? And the biker went, uh, uh. <laughs> He went, wow, I had a Jewish kid I went to school grammar school with, he was really nice. Uh, I don't know. And he talked to him, and he talked to him. And Gary couldn't get out because there was no bond. And they let the biker out, and he got to be in general population. And Gary was only fed baby food every fucking day for fucking two years. And the biker got the best job in the world. He fucking worked in the kitchen delivering food. And he fucking snuck Gary full 
meals. I know we have vegans, I love you. But he put hamburgers in that baby food. He put chicken in that baby food. And Gary got to eat real food. And they caught the guy. And they said, fuck you, Gary, and fuck you. And they put the biker in a cell. And prison guards, as they will do to control, used racism. And when there was a black, young black person arrested, they would throw him in with the Hells Angels to get raped and brutalized. And when there was a 19-year-old black, they would throw him, I mean, you know what I'm saying. And so the guy was in a cell with a whole bunch of biker Nazis, white guy, and they threw a 19-year-old in to get raped. And the biker pushed the black man behind him, not a civil rights worker, a fucking biker. And he pushed the 19-year-old behind him, and he fought off the other fucking bikers. And that guy was not raped, because Gary was willing to talk. That guy wasn't his enemy. And of all the amazing things, it's not Christmas. It's the fact that if we engage other people whose hearts are good, we can change them. And that's what Gary was. And he died, and his wife, Jakia, is still alive. God bless her, fighting. She had a bad, a bad uh, stroke, and half her body is not back to normal. And she would have been here, and she really loves us. Salute. Salute.